The general critical consensus on Far Cry 5 is that, like a lot of its AAA peers, it's committed to saying nothing. This is, unfortunately, not an uncommon thing in the world of expensive tentpole game releases. It's hard enough to get any game to say something coherent. Just getting a game out the door is challenging, but to get mechanical design, art direction, writing, level design, and more, all to move collectively towards a higher creative end, is even more difficult. But tentpoles have the additional challenge of financial pressure. If a game costs $100 million, $200 million, $250 million or more to make, there's an incentive to avoid saying anything specific in order to ensure that they alienate as few potential customers as possible, as the only way finances work on games this large is if the game is a blockbuster with everyone purchasing a copy. The result is usually a sort of milquetoast cowardice to confront any of the topics the game skirts around bringing up, which is a recurring pet peeve of mine. See also Deus Ex Mankind Divided, Bioshock Infinite, or Watch Dogs for examples of me ranting about this. In Far Cry 5's case, the attempts at controversy avoidance are obvious. Its cultists are vague, cartoonish parodies that are light on specifics to avoid offense. While obviously ambiguously Christian, the game goes out of its way to avoid name-dropping Jesus, or any specific ideology or theology, and instead focuses everything on Joseph's seed and a vague lowercase g god. And his faith that holds us together. And without it we are lost going so far as to have the cult leaders bring up Greek gods in order to make their point rather than rely on scripture. Do you know what hubris is? Arrogance before the gods. The Greeks saw it as a dangerous form of pride that invoked the goddess Nemesis, who would seek retribution. Their secessionary position isn't motivated by paranoia or federal government overreach or how taxes are inherently theft. They're just sort of incidentally secessionary because they overthrew all the cops and bought up all the land. They started buying up every farm for miles, then the radio station. Not long after that, they even had the fucking cops. Their own sovereign religious state built right here under our noses. They're a cult, but the kind that uses mind-controlled juice rather than the kind that actually exists. They're a nonsense amalgamation of signs and symbols that imply relevance to David Koresh and sovereign citizens' movements and the rise of right-wing extremism, but actually reflect none of them in any meaningful or substantive way. Consequently, the game isn't the scathing takedown of angry alt-right Americana that a lot of people thought it would be. For every step the game takes towards criticizing those targets, it takes exactly one step back, leaving it as a sort of carbon-neutral, flavorless, but really fun good time. Just some emergent comedy and heart-pounding action in the great American outdoors. But I don't know if it's that simple. A lot of effort was clearly expended trying to avoid stepping on toes throughout the game, so I kind of wanted to look under the hood and see how they try to pull that trick off, and indeed whether they did pull that trick off. And for a point of comparison, I'm going to do what every obnoxious video game critic does when talking about the Far Cry series, and use Far Cry 2 as a point of reference. Not because it's my favorite game in the franchise, although it easily is, but because I think that unlike Far Cry 5, Far Cry 2 is definitely interested in expressing a worldview, even if it does so in potentially awkward or heavy-handed ways. Superficially, at least, Far Cry 5 and Far Cry 2 have a lot in common. Both are open-world, first-person shooters set in an exotic wilderness. Both almost never break from that first-person perspective. Both encourage coming up with your own solutions to the problems you face through creative use of firearms in your environment. Both have vehicles and a progression system tied mostly to perks and new weapons. Both encourage hilarious emergent events in combat. And both focus on quixotic, eccentric demagogues who leave messages for you from afar. You know, there's a book I read a long time ago. I still think about it every day. It helps me understand life out here. The book talks about men and what motivates them. Simple, really. A living being seeks above all else to discharge its strength. Life itself is will to power. Nothing else matters. And I claim to be a perfect man. But I saw what was coming and I chose to act. To lead. Because society is broken. And the only way forward is to go back to the way things once were. From a distance, the two games sit easily next to each other in the series, far more so than the original Far Cry and any of the games that followed it up. But it's when you dig down into the nuts and bolts implementation of the gameplay that a degree of intentionality starts to assert itself in Far Cry 2's play that is simply missing from Far Cry 5. 
As a one-off example, Far Cry 2 has semi-destructible shacks made from sheet metal that bullets have a tendency to penetrate and that can be blown apart by cars or explosions, making most of the obvious cover impermanent and flimsy. <laughs> There's the occasional solid stone wall or rock you can use, but because most of the missions and checkpoints are full of thin-walled structures, it becomes really hard to hide from incoming fire or vehicles. Ah! Far Cry 5 has some of this on occasion. But mostly it has bulletproof trees, bulletproof furniture, bulletproof walls, bulletproof crates. If you can put a physical object between you and your enemy, odds are cover is going to be insured. I was actually able to avoid a sniper's fire by hiding behind a chain link fence with a tarp draped over it. And that minor change in how cover is handled encapsulates much of the philosophical differences between these two games. Far Cry 2 is a game about entropy and decay, a game about the best laid plans of mice and men, about a nihilistic take on the human compulsion to combat, about the fallout from conflict and how it stretches far beyond the obvious targets. Before I get ahead of myself, though, I should also probably note that Far Cry 2 is not deep. At its most complicated, it's a parable about the uncontrollable flames of war and the collateral damage it tends to cause. It's a nihilistic, depressing bedtime story for 25-year-old nerds in 2008, as deep a game about the gun and blood diamond trades as The Sneetches is about 1960s racism. But it does have a position on these things that it expresses through its mechanics. So when Far Cry 2 places you in combat situations where cover isn't really good and enemies can deal damage unseen, it's emphasizing that angle of chaos and of battles never fully being in your control. It sells its tone and thematics through its play. Far Cry 5, on the other hand, emphasizes player empowerment. If you see cover, it's cover. And that, more than anything else, is the trick. Again and again, you'll see this pattern repeat in almost any instance where the designers could choose between empowering the player or having their mechanics do something interesting that might say something, they went with the option that indulged the player in escapist fantasy rather than convey a concept. In a lot of ways, it's like what we saw happen in Dead Rising 4. What were mechanical staples that drove the work and gave it its identity and worldview could also be seen as frustrating to some players. Cutting them out made the game more enjoyable in an immediate and superficial sense. It refocuses the game on being whatever the player wants it to be. But it abdicates the developer from any responsibility to define anything but a core combat loop and maybe some tertiary side missions. Consequently, while Far Cry 5 might be more immediately engaging, its play is less meaningful because the interesting choices and challenges were removed in favor of never upsetting players, of always granting you power and authority. For another example, consider Fire. The untamed element, oldest of man's mysteries, giver of warmth, destroyer of forests, Far Cry is known for having fire. Fire propagation was sort of a big gimmick mechanic in Far Cry 2. It was the big technological hook that was sold as a golly gee thing, and it's been included in every Far Cry game since because it became a franchise-defining mechanic, kind of like parkour in Assassin's Creed or an intense sense of buyer's remorse in the Star Wars Battlefront games. But as time has gone on, I feel like it's been used less and less effectively. Like, it's included now because it's just a requirement for any Far Cry game to have fire propagation tech, but it only shows up when you use a flamethrower or Molotov cocktail or incendiary rounds, and that's about it. Like in Far Cry 5, it shows up when you, the player, perform an action that would cause fire in the universe intentionally, and occasionally when you bring a plane down or encounter a flamethrower enemy or maybe hit a stray red barrel or whatever. It doesn't even really show up that often in car explosions.
It turns fire into more of a cool aesthetic choice than a system you have to regularly contend with. But in Far Cry 2, fire is framed as a wild and uncontrollable force, cropping up all over in tricky ways that are difficult to predict. Like when you fire rockets, not only does the impact site of the rocket itself light the ground on fire, but when you launch a rocket, the area directly behind you catches on fire if there's any fuel to burn, so you'll often find yourself surprised in the heat of battle when, in a panic, you fire a rocket and then turn around to face an inferno. Cars taking heavy damage tend to catch fire, which in turn can propagate to the surrounding environment, and so too can just about any random explosion. <laughs> Oh, and pressurized canisters fly every which way before exploding, potentially igniting the ground in areas you can't predict till it explodes, and there are propane tanks that explode but also set the surrounding environment aflame. All of these things are in copious supply around the various areas the game asks you to do missions. While fire was a concern once or twice in Far Cry 5 for me, fire is a constant threat in Far Cry 2. And this is maybe a more minor point, but those mission areas are far more claustrophobic in Far Cry 2. From Far Cry 3 on, the enemy forts you need to take over are smallish and open, facilitating any number of approaches from any angle, and a lot of the story missions take place in military bunkers and other places where fire doesn't really matter. Far Cry 2 asks that you have to drive to the middle of, say, a refueling station or an airport or a junkyard, and that might only have one or two vectors of approach. This does mean that stealth is way more tacked on and vestigial in Far Cry 2, which, yeah. But it also means you're constantly in the thick of fights you often only escape by the skin of your teeth after things go horrendously awry. In Far Cry 5, with its emphasis on player empowerment, it's trivial to just take out the alarms from afar with a sniper rifle and then take out the remainder of the guards however you want. It's about player choice and expression through whatever means of horrendous death you want to inflict on people. There's a whole host of little mechanics I could go into that show this idea. In Far Cry 2, weapons degrade and jam, providing an emergent element of panic, but also reminding you that these are second-hand guns imported from still other wars, which the Jackal is quick to point out. Where do you get the weapons? It's a romantic notion that they all came out of the Soviet Union after the collapse. That was a windfall back in 89, maybe through 91, but that's all over. I move weapons, I profit from circulation. You get a ceasefire in Liberia, both sides disarm. You think they slag 2,000 tons of guns? No. They sell them to me. I resell them wherever the next war is starting. Those same Soviet guns from 1989? Oh, that's about half. The rest mostly come from old European armies. After they abandoned their colonies in the 60s and 70s, you know, French guns, Dutch, Belgian. So some of these guns are very old. They've been sold, bought, and sold repeatedly. <laughs> They're not biodegradable. There's the oft-maligned malaria mechanic, a sickness that the player characters come down with and will, at random points in the game, including in the middle of combat, hit you with a bout of nausea that you need pills to recover from. <laughs> When enemies go down, sometimes they aren't really down and will continue to shoot you while clutching their wounds. Respawning outposts, a recurring complaint about Far Cry 2, also showed the futility of your actions. Every time you clear an area out, more soldiers just keep coming. The point is that in Far Cry 2, there are forces that are bigger than you. Forces that you can try to account for, but will foil your plans regardless. You are not entirely in control, your fights are messy, there's a ton of collateral damage, and none of it amounts to very much. The omnipresent threat of fire and its unpredictable spread, second or third hand guns that constantly jam, malaria clouding your vision, the flimsy cover, and the arbitrary and ever-shifting respawning enemies you're tasked with taking out all contribute to that. It's a game about entropy and decay, a game about how conflict has victims you can't predict. It's a game with a dour view on human nature, but deeply rooted in the way we ignore the consequences of our actions. And it tells a lot of that story through its mechanics. Far Cry 5 isn't really interested in any of that. It doesn't want to be a game about fighting an actual secessionist religious cult because it doesn't want to make grandiose statements about the roles of religion or race or class in America. And it definitely doesn't want to talk about how those concepts feed into some of the country's collective ills. It's a game whose mechanics are entirely about making you feel like a cool shooty person. And it hopes it can skirt by using those ideas as set dressing while having a good time. So does Far Cry 5 manage to be a Seinfeld of games? A game about nothing? Well... No, it turns out the game isn't about nothing. It might not have a lot of the intentionally designed mechanics of Far Cry 2, but what mechanics does Far Cry 5 have? It has fly fishing from a dock with a cooler full of beer or the deck of your own pleasure craft. 
Speaking of pleasure craft, it has purchasable vehicles, from jet skis to ATVs to big rig trucks to fishing boats to helicopters you can use to view the mountains from on high. This game lets you collect, paint, and ride around in them as you will. It has side missions where you race through fiery rings in a classic American muscle car with the stars and stripes surrounding you as a callback to stuntmen like Evil Knievel. It has hunting. Hunting bears, hunting deer, skunks, turkeys, you name it. It has hiking and rappelling and parachuting. I would argue that Far Cry 5 is, in a lot of ways, a celebration of Montanian mountain life. But not the real thing, because that would involve looking at the actual politics, history, and lived realities of the region. Instead, it's the Coors Rocky Mountain beer ad and American-built Ford Tough commercial view of what it means to be an outdoorsy Montanian. A vacation package plus shooty bits. And those shooty bits are executed with fancy guns that never jam, never degrade, and are customizable with different paint jobs and accessories. The game fetishizes firearms, not as the tools of a corrupt trade or a death-bringing product of arms dealers like in Far Cry 2, but as a fashion accessory. Not everyone in the game is armed, but so many are that the population feels less like local community members and more like an occupying militia. Nice work getting rid of those cultists. Might be you could help me with something else. All I know is we got people to protect. I you got some sort of death wish? Finally, someone I can depend on. Citizens in your outposts will praise the Second Amendment as you swing in and try out the fancy gun the game just unlocked. This time it was a golden shotgun. Ooh. None of the looted criticism of guns remain from Far Cry 2, just the fun shooty bits. And as a result, the game kind of embraces guns and gun culture in a way Far Cry 2 didn't, even though they're both shooters. The game has also brought back the buddy system from Far Cry 2, allowing people to come save you if you get downed. In Far Cry 2, it was set up to reveal that they weren't really your buddies. When you flip to work with the Jackal at the end, you have to fight and kill them. They are paid mercenaries, after all, and you can go from buddy to target because someone paid them to shoot you. In Far Cry 5, it's mostly to give you a second health bar in a pinch, as well as to pick which of nine ways you want to emphasize your gameplay. Again, it's more about player empowerment than it is about making a point. Far Cry 5 also lets you hire locals as backup. Happy to lend a helping hand. They don't have any of the special abilities of the nine unique super friends, but they can help shoot Peggy's in a pinch. Every Fort Takeover involves everyday people coming and tearing down the symbols of Peggy's and putting up good old fashioned American flags. Any NPC might alert you to a new mission or weapons cache, and random hunters will trade goods and arms with you. It creates an intimacy not with individuals, but with the population. It paints this idea of a sort of hard-working blue-collar America that's got a scrappy can-do attitude, but is just caught up in all this cult nonsense. And because of all this, Far Cry 5 ends up framing its conflict as one between the beer commercial idea of real Americans and these twisted monsters that use brain-controlled juice and kill indiscriminately and are just cartoons. Nothing says Far Cry 5 more to me than this scene that involves three campers next to two dead bodies, presumably killed by them. There's a dancing couple and another seated playing music, and the couple have military-grade rifles slung over their backs and wear t-shirts with American flag patterns, one of which is a skull. This scene with its dissonant images of peace and violence, death and life, mundanity and murder, would surely be a piece of parody in any other context. My girl, my girl, don't you lie to me. Tell me where did you sleep last night? But here it's played straight. A quiet, intimate moment where you get to see the common folks being themselves. Guns, death, Americana, and all. It ended for me when Faith appeared, disappeared, and summoned some angels, at which point everyone started shooting their guns and a wolf bit my leg. Because Far Cry. <laughs> but 
But the idea that the game thought it was being sweet and intimate with that image really haunted me. That scene cemented what, to me, Far Cry 5 is ultimately about. The game condemns the Peggies as murderous cultists, but advocates for something of a prepper light lifestyle. Not full-on hunker-down-in-a-bunker prepper, but prepper-adjacent. It's a game about how cool guns are. A game about the real America being lost and needing to recapture it by force. We fought for this. We fought for this good, free feeling. A game about a local cop doing what federal government won't or can't. A game whose perspective is that living in a bunker is probably overkill, but having a bunker is maybe a good idea. A game where the good guys torture enemies through electrocution and it doesn't go remarked upon because that's what you do to your enemies. When I joined the army, I heard torture stories. You get put in an enemy chair and pressed for answers. Intel. That's one thing. Not a whole lot of them get a kick out of seeing you squirm. They do it because they have to. Finally, it's a game that, through its endings, suggests that the best way to face the angry secessionist religious death cult next door is to turn a blind eye to it. Leave them in peace and nothing happens. Force them to change and you are responsible for the violence that follows. The player either falls victim to their mind control or witnesses the apocalypse. Either way, you lose and they win and it's framed as your fault. Countless people have been killed and it is your fault. When are you going to realize that every problem cannot be solved with a bullet? The nihilistic fatalism of Far Cry 2's ending stemmed from a bitter distaste for conflict in the face of its inevitability given human nature. Far Cry 5's empty nihilism just suggests that while the cult was wrong, you were also kind of wrong to interfere anyways. They weren't violent until you forced their hand, and they were either right about the apocalypse and in a way kind of prescient and preparing, or you get your comeuppance for interfering by being forced to attack your friends because brain controlled juice. This is a lazy, trope-laden, I asked you to be violent and you were, jerk, what does that say about you, haha, -ha, style video game gotcha that is just entirely too common these days. But it can also be read as an argument that you maybe should mind your own business and let folks believe as they will, regardless of the harm it may cause others. It's really not subtle the way the game suggests the most important thing you could do is ignore David Koreshi sovereign citizen types, no matter what. When you first came here, I gave you the choice to walk away. You chose not to. In the face of God, I'm making you that offer one last time. And yeah, there's something mildly ironic about a game some people were excited to see critique the extreme right that tries so hard to say nothing, it ends up embracing center-right politics. But just because its politics are potentially disagreeable doesn't mean it's saying nothing, and we ignore that at our peril. And to be clear, I'm not saying the game is bad because its politics are right-leaning. You can respond to the game's politics however you will. It's not like I can rake Far Cry 5 across the coals for making shooting things fun after I've praised id Software for doing the same thing in multiple videos. What I am saying is, it's bad to suggest the game has no political perspective because it doesn't try to tackle its most obvious targets. Far Cry 5 doesn't have a view from nowhere, it's not a completely vacuous nothing, even though it's clear it wants to be that with how much it pulls its punches on its subject matter. But by focusing on empty, surface-level player empowerment and refusing to take a stance on anything, either through narrative or gameplay, Far Cry 5's more incidental ideas come to define the game's worldview.